So today I want to talk about Disappeared, Episode 3, Season 1, Amy St. Laurent. And she disappeared October 20th, 2001 from Portland, Maine. So the gist of this story is uh, she's a young white female, I believe she was 23 years old. And she went out one night on the town. She was not by herself. She was with a gentleman that she had met a couple weeks previous in Florida. So she had gone to Florida to catch up with this friend of hers. Well, she caught up with that friend, but that friend had a friend and she caught up with him. And they became uh, maybe kind of romantic, not sure, but there was something there enough where when she went back home to Maine, he came up to visit her. So the night in question when she goes missing, they go to a pool hall and a bar together. Um, she ends up playing pool with two other guys. Um, I believe the name Eric is the guy that she's with and he stays off to the side kind of and just watches. Um, he describes the one guy as kind of a ladies man, a smooth talker also very good at pool Eric and Amy leave and they go to a nightclub well lo and behold who shows up the nightclub these two guys that she was playing pool with Eric doesn't dance so he's off to the side um, Amy's out dancing and one of the guys Eric sees that she's kind of having some sort of interest with We've all been there, okay? You're at a bar, you're at a club. You see it happen, you see it develop, maybe some flirtation, some touching, you know, laughing, you know, flirting. In my mind, that gives Eric some jealousy issues, okay? He's jealous about this. He had just coming up all the way from Florida to be with her, and I'm sure he had romantic interests on his mind. And he says, I go to the bathroom, it's a long line. When I come out, Amy's gone. I look around, but I can't find her. He has nowhere to go, right? Because he's from Florida. He goes back to her apartment. She had left, Amy had left her cell phone, her keys, and her pocketbook in his car. So he has his keys. He goes into her house, her apartment. Um, she's not there. He doesn't want to, he says in police interviews, he doesn't, he feels kind of weird staying there. So, because he doesn't really know her that well, and she never came home. He's probably pissed off in my mind, and he goes out into his car and sleeps. Now, do you buy that story? If that's all you knew? Maybe, maybe not, right? Next morning, he wakes up, goes back into the apartment, she's still not there he showers he leaves her a note which is not too kind according to Amy's sister you know basically hey why'd you leave me you know where'd you go and he he leaves do I buy that story well how about you do you buy that story I mean it sounds a little odd to me okay that he goes back in and he doesn't want to spend the night there, but he'll go back in in the morning and shower. Mm, I don't know. What I would want to do is dig into his background a little bit further and see what his uh, background shows any violence or anything of the sort. Amy never comes home. She misses work that Monday. Now people are really concerned. Apparently this guy finds out whether it was via flyer or a mutual friend or something that she is missing he calls police he goes in for an interview and he he, he says everything that I just told you happened um, but he doesn't know where she's at please check out his alibis I mean he really doesn't have an alibi he's sleeping by himself but he he had stopped and got gas and did other things and all this checked out Somebody else contacts police, and it's this guy named Jeffrey Gorman. Jeffrey Gorman says, hey, I, 
I seen a missing person flyer of Amy. I was with her that night. So they bring him in the police station, and lo and behold, he's the one that was shooting pool with her and then went to the nightclub and she was dancing with. He's, You see the interview. I mean, he's very matter-of-fact. He's got answers. Everything looks good. He says, hey, um, she says we're at the club. She says, hey, my ride left me. I don't know where he's at. I don't have my cell phone. I don't have my purse. And he says, well, we're having an after hours party at my apartment. Do you want to come? She says, yes. He takes her there. This party never materializes and it ends up just being uh, Gorman, Amy, and a roommate or two of Gorman's. Apparently, Amy felt, you know, she didn't want to be there. And she asked to be taken back to the nightclub. Now, this is where things get tricky. Gorman says to the police, yes, I took her back to the nightclub. Uh, I didn't even put my car in park. I pulled in between two fire hydrants. He's very specific about this shit. Pulls in, don't, I don't even put it in park, and she gets out. That's the last I've seen her. Everything kind of adds up with him. His alibis are checking out because he says he gets home after dropping her off about 15, 20 minutes later. They interview roommates. Roommates say, yep, he took her home. He came back about 15, 20 minutes later. The investigators do what every good investigator does is dig. And what do they start looking at is, okay, listen, he was the last person to see her. Let's look into his background. They look into his background. They find out he has a long history of violence. Okay, they start interviewing some of his past uh, relationships because he's known as a ladies' man. These girls said, yes, I had sex with him, not necessarily consensual. I don't know if, you know, they were drugged or he just didn't take no for an answer. So these girls are giving stories that make you think, okay, he could have done this with Amy. They run a vehicle, either a vehicle registration, they said vehicle search. Now... I've run, run vehicle searches um, through NCIC, that's National uh, Crime Database. Um, usually, like, you want to know, okay, I remember doing this for a case. I had a suspect, and I said, I need to, I need to put him near the crime scene during that time. How, how can you do it? There's a million different ways. Surveillance video, interview people or run his driver's license and see if he got pulled over or anything. Well, lo and behold, they do this just like good investigators and I cannot say praise these cops enough. Uh, they run it, they find out, wait a second, he was pulled over at 314 in the morning, the night of Amy's disappearance. Now, he originally said, I was home back in bed. It took me 15, 20 minutes to drop her off back at the club. I came back home and went to bed by 2, 2.30, whatever time that was. Um, and his roommate seemed to substantiate that claim. Well, here they have him getting pulled over by police at 3.14 a.m. So they know he's lying. And he's coming from a different direction from where he said he would, would have been coming from dropping her off. So, what they want to do now, and what they did, is they re-interviewed the roommates. And the roommates said, okay, uh, I might have been wrong. I, I don't know what time he came home. In fact, another roommate is interviewed. He says, I have came home real late, 4 in the morning. From uh, We went out to eat breakfast after being out. I saw... Gorman in the bathroom cleaning up and he was fully clothed. That's important. He's supposed to be in bed, right? In bed by 2. Even if he was in bed by 2.30 or 3. We're talking 4 o'clock in the morning, okay? So, police are, are focusing in on, in on this guy, without a doubt. They bring him back in. They interview him. Now he has changed his appearance. Okay? This is what is called post-offense behavior. I always tell people this. 
if there's a suspect in a homicide case and they are not accustomed to homicides, meaning they're not a serial killer, a lot of times they will change their behavior, change their looks, move out of the area. This guy did all of that. He now had a shaved head. He had piercings. Um, he had left the area. He began drinking more, smoking more, doing more drugs. That's all indicative of somebody that's guilty. They ask him if they could search his car. He refuses. Okay. Right there is a, a huge red flag. The next day, however, he takes his car to a detail shop and gets it detailed. I believe he cleaned it himself. Um, it was his mom's boyfriend's shop, I believe. Um, but yeah, so he details the car. Is that enough? Well, let me ask you this. What do you think now? I mean, sure, I think I've told the story in a little bit of a biased state but you have one guy who it came all the way up from Florida to be with her she ends up leaving with other people I mean is that motive do you see jealousy be remember money or greed sex and revenge okay yes it's possible I, I definitely look into him but this guy all those red flags coming up and why he's lying about this stuff um, so the, he, he ends up leaving town he goes to I believe Alabama which was his hometown and while, while there he pulls a gun on somebody for looking at him wrong or something he has a standoff with police he eventually is arrested for that in the meantime back in Maine they're still searching for Amy. There is a search unit of... I forget what they, they called them. It was a specialized search unit that is out. They are searching places frequented by Gorman. What I mean by that, and this is, this is very smart and very key. Gorman's place of his mom's residency in that area access roads stuff that went into the woods stuff like that good places to search okay I, I believe he lived where he lived was downtown not not many places to hide a body right they searched this wooded area now to me it's almost he went fishing there okay they acknowledge that in the show but to me I guarantee and they didn't say anything about this and I didn't read it anywhere but I guarantee he had taken women there to have sex before I guarantee it so they search this area they step on an area that feels different than the solid ground they had just been on they start uncovering and what do they find they find Amy Okay. Six weeks and six days after she went missing, they found her. The burial location is three tenths of a mile from his mother's house. Now you're seeing a bunch of circumstantial evidence come to light. They start, you know, is that enough to arrest somebody? Yeah, you're getting pretty close, okay? They had talked to this Gorman fella's father-in-law or mother's boyfriend. I can't remember what he was, what the relationship was. But he had borrowed a shovel from them a few days after Amy disappeared. It's adding up, right? Now, now more stuff. So they take him to a grand jury. And the grand jury indicts him. A big component to the grand jury indictment was a confession okay a confession as in this 
his mom calls him and says the police just found Amy's body. He confesses to her that she said something to me. We went for a walk around the pond and I shot her in the head. Very specific, right? He didn't say I just shot her. I shot her in the head. Lo and behold, at the autopsy, we find she wasn't stabbed. She wasn't strangled. She was beaten up, but she was shot in the head. That is a good example as to why police do not release all information. Okay? Had they released how she was sh how she was killed and specifically shot in the head, they might not have gotten an indictment on this guy. I think Mike Chitwood. Mike Chitwood is a I, re I just was doing research on this and I just saw that and I saw that name and I was like, I think I know him. So, I, I think this is the guy. I'm not 100% sure. I don't know how many police officers are named Mike Chitwood, chief of police. Could be the same guy, but he he sent me this a long time ago. I don't know if you can see that, but if it was him, you know, I guess there's another six degrees of separation between me and uh, who knows <laughs> somebody that's being talked about here but they they held that back and that was good he goes to trial and he is found guilty okay one of the things that struck me about this was this was this was a sexually motivated crime When she was found, her pants and her underwear were pulled down to her ankles. What's that remind you of? You just watched Martha Moxley. The exact same thing, right? I had another case, uh, Jennifer Hill, pulled down to her ankles by an offender who I believe didn't get what he wanted. Like Michael Skakel or whoever did that, Tommy Skakel. You know, you choose who it was. Didn't get what he wanted. And is he doing it to degrade her? Or my theory is, hey, that's what I wanted and I'm going to get it. Doesn't mean they had necrophilia. They didn't have sex with a corpse. But at least in their deluded mind, I'm getting what I wanted. I'm going to see it. And I think if I had an opinion on this, that's what happened here believe he took her back there to have sex with her she refused his advances he either raped her or tried to rape her and when he struggled or whatever he shot her now that bugs me a little bit because typically I don't see even though I know it happens an offender using a gun and shooting somebody like that. <laughs> yes, I guess if they have it, you know, if they have it, it's a lot easier to shoot somebody than it is to pick up a rock and beat them or, or he didn't have a knife, but he could have strangled her. Um, I'm just trying to think, like, if we knew nothing about that guy, and all we did was, let's say a hunter was out walking those woods and he found that body. And the police had no idea that she was even missing, let's say. And you find the body. It's a crime scene, at least a dump location. And you find the body has the pants and her underwear pulled down to her ankles and she died of a gunshot wound. What would you think? You would possibly think well, maybe it wasn't, maybe it wasn't a sexual assault. Maybe it was disguised to be a sexual assault, um, you know, by pulling down the pants, but then you wouldn't bury him. You'd want the body to be found. So your staging of the crime scene is seen. So, you know, gunshot, gunshots to females, uh, I, they're tough. 
Because a lot of time, that to me does not show a sexual motivated crime. To me, you know, I don't know. You always hear that, okay? And I got a problem with that a little bit. If somebody stabs somebody or they choke them, they say it's personal. Yeah, and a gun is supposed to be not personal because you can distance. But wasn't this pretty personal? You know? So my point is, it's very, very tricky to just go off of what is the norm. You know, you see a body and it's a gunshot, you, you don't assume that it's a sexual. You know, it's a robbery gone wrong or something. You can't always assume that. You have to dig deeper and find other, other underlying factors. Sometimes it's hard. Because let's say, let's say, let's say it's a prostitute. She's shot in the head. No, no signs of sexual assault. Would you think that's vigilante justice? Somebody's just going out and killing? Do you think somebody robbed her of her money, one of her Johns, and just shot her? Um, you know, there's so many different scenarios that ha that's in play. And that's why it's very difficult and it's very, it's a thin line on crime scene assessments and body dump locations. I mean, that's why I always say, I think, you know, I don't know for sure. I believe. And people get on me for that because I don't say 100%. Well, that's because it isn't 100%. You know, there's so many other underlying things that you have to look at. You can start going down a path. Okay, she has a gunshot wound. There's money, so it's not a robbery. The money's in her pocket. She's got jewelry. She's not sexually assaulted. Okay, maybe this is just not personal. It is a revenge killing. Maybe. You can start going down that road, right? But you don't want to commit 100%. Because then you get tunnel vision, right? And that's what we don't want. You don't want tunnel vision. So, this is this was a good case. And again, it's disappeared and it had an outcome. You know, on the, the previous case, Paige Burgefield, that did have the exact same thing. It had an outcome. The first one, Brandy Wells did not. So, these are different. But what I love about these shows is I learn things. Just like a lot, of, a lot of things confirm my thoughts, but a lot of things change. It, for instance, when I'm watching this show, I think, hey, that guy that's coming up from Florida to meet her, and she, she ghosts him, right? She goes with these two guys. I'd be pissed. It's 2 in the morning. I drove all the way up from Florida. I've been here visiting you. Things are going good. I went to a bar with you. You're playing pool with this guy. Now you're dancing with him. Okay. Yeah. You're going to be a little upset. So he has motive, right? But you start looking into his background maybe or his alibis and everything starts checking out. It's going to steer you away from him. Go to another suspect. So I learn as I go through and I watch these things. And I just want to say how, how you know, you know how I am. If you watched Alonzo Brooks case that I did, Phyllis O'Brien, th there's, if police don't do their job properly and, or seek help, I, won't, I don't want to say incompetence because I can deal with incompetence, but ask for help. Or when help comes to you, don't turn it down. But when police do good, good, solid police work, they need recognized. And this Portland, Maine Police Department, every one of them did a great job. I mean, they did, they did everything the way it should be. The way police should work. The way investigators should work. So kudos to those investigators. Uh, I would shake every one of their hands. And I know the family of Amy St. Laurent is very grateful for them. So 
couple notes that I've written down here and I want to make sure that I say them because because what every time you write something down it means something to you so I wrote some things down GPS I have a star by it. they put a GPS unit on the suspects vehicle why did they do that well they had planted a seed that they uh, had a suspect and were close to finding her body or something and they were hoping that he would go back to that location well he did go back okay he went back and buried her after he borrowed a shovel so he did go back but that he went back before they put this GPS unit on it very good you have to have a court order you have to have probable cause in order to get a GPS unit on a vehicle I've done it it's encompassing so it takes a lot of work and it takes you convincing the the judge hey this is our guy more than likely and this is going to work excellent police work I remember my first time I put on a GPS it's it's, it's a hairy situation you know it's two or three in the morning you're hoping the guy's in bed because you had done surveillance the previous two nights and he's gone to bed at you know midnight so but there's nothing saying he ain't gonna get up at two in the morning while you're sneaking into his backyard and the one we put one on was a uh, a big uh, truck like a, a semi truck and he had parked it in a gravel lot over top of a huge mud puddle okay huge mud puddle so I had to get on my back underneath this and I'm soaking wet because I'm, I'm low crawling on my back to get underneath this truck to put this GPS unit underneath it and we did that it was an FBI case that we were working on and I remember being I had my partner there he was a lookout watching the house making sure no lights came on but it was still an intense situation and uh, you know kind of scary you know but uh, but that's what I did that's what these guys did and it was great police work um, that's really it, it everything else I covered except for this I have written down here there was two parts to this story one is to find Amy and once you've done that you can cross that off you did that okay that's a big first step any family member will tell you that the second part is to find out who did it and get justice so I think that's all on this one this was a very intriguing case I'm glad I love that there was an update on it and that they found out who did it for especially for the family and for the police officers involved to get the recognition that they deserve and you know for this guy to be brought to justice for what he did and take on away you know, such a beautiful person and I just I it's why I got into law enforcement that's why I've become a detective because you there's pieces of crap out there like this and let's get them all off the street so they can't hurt anybody else and I'm glad the police officers did such an outstanding outstanding a 10 out of a 10 job on this and getting this guy so that's it for Disappeared, Episode 3, Season 1. Until next time, Mains out. Oh, sexy.